What if we could rewrite history? What if the animals we've lost could roam the earth once more? From the towering woolly mammoth to the elusive Tasmanian tiger, the idea of de-extinction is no longer just science fiction. It's becoming a real possibility. Welcome to today's deep dive into one of the most controversial topics in science, de-extinction. With groundbreaking advances in genetic technology, scientists are closer than ever to bringing back species that disappeared centuries ago. But here's the big question. Just because we can, does it mean we should? Today, we'll explore the science behind de-extinction, its potential impact on ecosystems, and the ethical dilemmas it raises. Are we playing God, or is this humanity's chance to make things right? In this video, we will be discussing the three animals I believe are most likely to make a comeback. The woolly mammoth, passenger pigeon, and thylacine. Firstly, let's start with one of the most iconic candidates for de-extinction, the woolly mammoth. These majestic giants roamed vast areas of the earth during the Ice Age, from Europe to North America, thriving in cold, tundra-like environments. The woolly mammoth, a close relative of modern elephants, could reach up to 13 feet tall and weigh as much as six tons. With thick fur, a layer of fat for insulation, and those iconic curved tusks, they were perfectly adapted to their icy habitats. Woolly mammoths first appeared around 400,000 years ago and coexisted with early humans, who it is widely believed hunted them for food, tools, and even shelter. But as the ice age ended and temperatures warmed, their numbers began to decline. Most mammoths went extinct about 10,000 years ago, with the last isolated population surviving on Rangel Island until roughly 4,000 years ago. For context, this is around the same time the pyramids of Egypt were being built. So why bring them back? Scientists argue that reviving woolly mammoths could have significant ecological benefits. The idea is to reintroduce them into Arctic regions to restore a habitat known as the Mammoth Steppe, a grassland ecosystem that once dominated the Ice Age. Scientists are exploring how to achieve this by combining woolly mammoth DNA extracted from well-preserved specimens with that of modern Asian elephants. The goal? Create a hybrid species that can thrive in the cold and help heal our planet. Mammoths could help reverse climate change effects by knocking down trees and exposing grasses, which reflect sunlight and prevent permafrost from thawing. This would reduce the release of greenhouse gases like methane trapped in the frozen ground. But while this all sounds promising, it's not without its challenges or its critics. Is reintroducing a species that's been extinct for thousands of years truly the best solution? or could it lead to unforeseen consequences? Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. While bringing back the woolly mammoth sounds like an exciting scientific breakthrough, it comes with its own set of unique challenges and potential risks. First, let's talk about the ecosystem they'd return to. The Arctic tundra today is very different from the mammoth's ancient world. The once expansive mammoth steppe grasslands have largely been replaced by mossy tundra and forests. Reintroducing mammoths could disrupt current ecosystems, potentially harming species that have adapted to the modern Arctic environment. Would reintroducing a massive herbivore displace other animals or damage existing habitats instead of restoring them? Then there's the question of care. Asian elephants, the mammoth's closest relatives, are endangered themselves. To create mammoth hybrids, scientists would need to use Asian elephant surrogates for breeding, a process that is invasive, risky, and ethically questionable. This could divert conservation efforts away from protecting Asian elephants, which are already struggling to survive. Even if the science works, are we creating a true woolly mammoth? The hybrids would likely have mammoth-like traits, but wouldn't be exact replicas. They'd essentially be genetically modified elephants with mammoth characteristics. Can we truly call them mammoths, or are we just creating a Frankenstein species to fit our vision? Another concern is the potential environmental impact. Mammoths were migratory animals that traveled vast distances, shaping their ecosystems over large territories. Modern landscapes are fragmented by human activity, and introducing mammoths into a smaller, controlled area might limit their natural behavior. How do we ensure these creatures thrive without confining them to artificial spaces? And finally, there's climate change itself. 
While mammoths might help prevent permafrost thaw in theory, the time it takes to breed, adapt, and establish a population could be decades or even centuries. By then, the effects of climate change might have already reshaped the Arctic in ways we can't predict, making the mammoth's impact negligible or even counterproductive. Next up is a species that once dominated the skies of North America, the passenger pigeon. These birds weren't just abundant, they were a force of nature, with flocks so massive they were known to darken the sky for hours at a time. The passenger pigeon, slightly larger than a modern morning dove, was known for its incredible speed and agility. These birds were social creatures, forming enormous flocks that could stretch for miles. They relied on sheer numbers for survival, overwhelming predators, and efficiently foraging food across the forests of the eastern United States and Canada. For thousands of years, passenger pigeons played a vital role in shaping forest ecosystems. By consuming and dispersing vast quantities of seeds and nuts, they help maintain healthy, biodiverse forests. But their reliance on large numbers became their downfall. As European settlers expanded, these birds were hunted on a massive scale for meat and feathers, and their habitats were destroyed. The last known wild passenger pigeon was killed in 1900, and the species officially went extinct in 1914, with the death of Martha, the last captive pigeon at the Cincinnati Zoo. So, why bring them back? One of the biggest reasons is their ecological role. Passenger pigeons were ecosystem engineers, shaping forests in ways that modern species cannot replicate. Their feeding and roosting habits created natural disturbances, opening up space for new plants to grow, cycling nutrients, and increasing biodiversity. Scientists believe that reintroducing passenger pigeons could help restore balance to eastern forests, which have changed significantly since their extinction. The plan to bring them back involves using the DNA of closely related species, like the band-tailed pigeon, to edit and recreate key traits of the passenger pigeon. If successful, these birds could be reintroduced to their historic ranges, potentially revitalizing forests and benefiting countless other species. The passenger pigeon's return could serve as a powerful symbol of what's possible in conservation science. It could inspire efforts to protect other species and habitats before they reach the brink of extinction. Reintroducing the passenger pigeon isn't just about nostalgia or fixing a past mistake. It's about giving our forests a chance to heal and evolve in ways that only these birds can provide. But as with all de-extinction efforts, there are challenges. While the idea of seeing passenger pigeons fill the skies again is compelling, bringing them back is far from simple. First, the forests that passenger pigeons once thrived in are not the same today. These birds relied on vast, uninterrupted hardwood forests to support their massive flocks. But much of that habitat has been lost to agriculture, urban development, and logging. Even if we brought passenger pigeons back, where would they go? The fragmented nature of modern forests might make it impossible for them to thrive as they once did. Then there's the issue of competition. Passenger pigeons would be entering an ecosystem that's already home to numerous bird species. Their sheer numbers and voracious appetite for seeds and nuts could disrupt current populations, potentially pushing some modern birds out of their niches. Another concern is disease. Passenger pigeons lived in dense flocks, which made them more susceptible to spreading diseases among themselves and to other species. Reintroducing them could unintentionally create new vectors for avian illnesses, putting existing wildlife at risk. From a practicality perspective, it is well understood the passenger pigeon relied on immense numbers in order to avoid predation and survive. For this species to truly become de-extinct and thrive, a mass population of this animal would need to be engineered. This would undoubtedly be impractical, as this time may be better spent improving populations of already struggling modern native bird species instead. Finally, let's turn our attention to the thylacine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger. This remarkable predator was one of Australia's most iconic marsupials, yet it tragically vanished from the wild less than a century ago. The thylacine, named for its tiger-like stripes, was a carnivorous marsupial native to Tasmania, mainland Australia, and New Guinea. About the size of a medium dog, it had a stiff, kangaroo-like tail, a head that could open wide like a crocodile's, 
and a pouch for carrying its young, just like a kangaroo. It was the apex predator of its ecosystem, preying on kangaroos, wallabies, and small animals. Thylacines thrived for thousands of years, but began to decline when humans arrived in Australia, bringing dingoes and altering their habitat. On the island of Tasmania, where they survived the longest, they faced relentless persecution from European settlers who saw them as a threat to livestock. This led to extensive hunting campaigns supported by government bounties. Habitat loss and competition with introduced species like dogs and foxes sealed their fate. The last known wild thylacine was killed in 1930, and the species was declared extinct in 1936 after the death of the last captive individual, Benjamin, in a Tasmanian zoo. So why bring the thylacine back? One of the biggest reasons is the potential ecological benefit. Without the thylacine, Tasmania's ecosystems have suffered from an imbalance. For example, invasive species like feral cats and foxes have taken over, preying on native wildlife and contributing to the decline of many species. Thylacines could help restore balance by reclaiming their role as top predators, controlling populations of invasive and overabundant species. Bringing back the thylacine could also protect smaller native animals. By reintroducing a predator that evolved alongside these species, scientists believe we could create a more balanced and resilient ecosystem. On the scientific front, the thylacine offers an exciting challenge. Scientists are working with preserved DNA from museum specimens to potentially clone or engineer thylacines using closely related marsupials, like the numbat or Tasmanian devil. Successfully bringing back the thylacine could push the boundaries of genetics and conservation biology. And there's also a cultural advantage. The thylacine is an iconic symbol of Tasmania and Australian wildlife. Its return could boost ecotourism and raise awareness about the importance of conservation, inspiring efforts to protect other endangered species. The idea of seeing the thylacine roaming Tasmania's forests again is captivating, and it offers the potential for real ecological and cultural benefits. But as with any de-extinction project, there are significant hurdles to consider. As exciting as the idea of bringing back the thylacine sounds, it's important to consider the unique challenges that come with reintroducing this predator. First, the habitat that thylacines once thrived in has changed dramatically. Tasmania's ecosystems have been heavily altered by human activity, including agriculture, urban development, and the introduction of invasive species. Even if we bring the thylacine back, would there be enough suitable habitat for them to survive and hunt effectively. Then there's the issue of competition. Invasive predators like feral cats and foxes have filled the niche once occupied by the thylacine. Reintroducing thylacines could create unexpected conflicts between species, potentially leading to greater ecological disruption rather than balance. Another concern is whether the recreated thylacines would truly behave like their extinct counterparts. With no living thylacines to study, Scientists can only guess at their behavior based on historical accounts, which are often uh, incomplete or exaggerated. If the new thylacines don't hunt or behave as expected, they might struggle to integrate into the ecosystem. Ethically, the process of bringing them back is complex. Since thylacines are marsupials, closely related species like Tasmanian devils or numbats would likely be used as surrogates. This raises concerns about the welfare of those animals, which are already vulnerable or endangered themselves. Using them for de-extinction projects could divert resources and attention away from their conservation. Finally, there's the risk of unintended consequences. Tasmania's ecosystems have adapted to the absence of the thylacine over the past century. Reintroducing a predator could have ripple effects we can't fully predict potentially endangering species that have grown reliant on the current balance. While the thylacine's return could offer incredible ecological and cultural benefits, it's clear that reviving an extinct predator is not without its risks. Balancing the scientific ambition with the practical and ethical challenges is no easy task. So is the dream of seeing the Tasmanian tiger again worth the potential costs? That's for us and future generations to decide. Is it worth the risks to correct past mistakes and restore what's been lost? Or should our focus be on protecting the species and ecosystems we still have? The possibilities are exciting, but the implications are just as complex. 
The science of de-extinction is bringing us closer than ever to resurrecting them. But the question remains, even if we could, should we? So what do you think? If you could bring these animals back, would you? Let us know your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more thought-provoking discussions. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.